I am thrilled to see so many of you who got up on a Saturday morning and instead of just watching TV or playing computer games, you are here to listen and talk about physics. So thank you for doing that and welcome. We in the Chicagoland area are extremely fortunate to be surrounded by scientific excellence and discovery. Not only do we have the world-class University of Chicago, which hosted, is hosting us today here on the South side, we are also home to two US Department of Energy National Laboratories, the Argo National Laboratory and the Fermi National Accelerator Laboratory. So Fermilab is located west of Chicago in Batavia. How many of you have you been to Batavia? Great, excellent. In fact, on a clear day, we can actually see the Chicago skyline from the top floor of our main building, the Wilson Hall, which is an iconic building. One of the, I would say the most beautiful building among all the US Department of Energy National Laboratories. And there are 17 of them throughout our country. While geographically close to the city, our laboratory can sometimes feel like an entirely different world. Going to work every day feels a bit like entering a nature preserve. Fermilab it has 6,800 6, acres campus, which includes not just world-class science facilities, but also a restored tall grass prairie and herd of bison that lives there year round. But our biggest scientific pride is that we are the only national laboratory in the country whose sole mission is elementary particle physics. Elementary particle physics studies the most fundamental constituents of matter and how they interact with each other. So it studies the building blocks based on which we're all made of. So it, is, it tries to answer some truly profound questions about our universe and about everything we see around us. Our current science program includes long and short baseline neutrino programs. Neutrino is our flagship program. These programs, these experiments are NOVA and the short baseline experiments, a suite of neon experiments. Neon is like neutrino is another type of elementary particle. We have the neon G minus two and the mu two E that's coming online soon. Plus, with the advent of physical quantum computers, our mission has expanded to include the study of quantum computing with a Fermilab hosted SQMS center and the Oak Ridge hosted quantum science center. Now, I want to say that these two centers are two of just five national quantum information science and technology centers. And we host one of the, of the five, and we are major participants in a second one. In fact, Argon hosts a second one. So we really, our vision and our dream is to make Chicago land together with our partners, the capital of quantum computing in the years to come. We also have exciting things in store for the future. As we speak, we are deep in preparations, no pun intended, for Dune, the deep underground neutrino experiment. This is a multi-billion dollar international particle physics experiment that will revolutionize the field of neutrino physics. Once constructed, Dune will be the most comprehensive neutrino experiment in the world we say the best in class neutrino experiment in the world. And it is being built right in our backyard. 
since it is scheduled to turn on and start taking data in about 10 years, some of the young minds here might be among the first physicists to do science with this remarkable experiment. I sure hope to see many of you 10 years from now taking data in Dune. We at Fermilab place great value in sharing the wonders of physics with our neighbors and our local community. Saturday morning physics is one way to do this. A proud Fermilab tradition, Saturday morning physics was created over 40 years ago by one of my predecessors, former Fermilab director, Leon Lederman, a Nobel laureate. Well, the predecessor is for the director, not the Nobel. <laughs> His goal was for Saturday morning physics to inspire the next generation of young scientists by introducing them to modern physics as told by leaders and experts in a variety of fields. And the Saturday morning physics program has gone on since its inception uninterrupted every single year. And this is remarkable. Uh, and, and it talks about how successful and impactful the program has been. Even during COVID, it was held um, uh, via Zoom, but it was held. Never miss a bit. Since 1980, Saturday morning physics has explored topics like the theory of relativity, quantum mechanics, particle physics, and the standard model of particle physics. Now the program has expanded to include our new on campus experiments, quantum computing, and climate change even. And when it is held on site, we now give students a tour of different parts of the laboratory. This Saturday, we're thrilled to be on the University of Chicago campus to help kick off the Southside Science Festival with a satellite edition of Saturday Morning Physics. So initially we planned at this point to have the president of the University of Chicago, President Paula Livizatos, to welcome you. And I was going to introduce him, but he told us this morning he's not feeling very well. So he's very sorry to miss this, but he will come back and meet and interact with all of you. So instead, it is my great honor and privilege to invite Dr. Brian Ramson, a, nuclear, a, a, a neutrino physicist at Fermilab, and the one who conceived the Saturday morning physics here in south side of Chicago to give us some remarks. So, Brian, thank you very much. Hey folks, so I didn't expect to really be talking today. You guys have heard a lot from me already, but uh, I guess I just wanted to go into some of the details about why I think this is important and also about what's happening with, with you Chicago and some of the history here. How much of that history do you already know? We got somebody all the way in the back. Most of you don't really know how fancy you Chicago is in terms of physics. So how many of you have seen Oppenheimer? You guys know what Oppenheimer is about, right? Anybody want to say what Oppenheimer is about? Go ahead. Make sure you speak up. Manhattan the Manhattan Project. So that was the race to build the first nuclear bomb before anybody else could do it. That was a significant scientific uh, undertaking. It took hundreds of scientists to figure this out scattered across the world. And you, Chicago, played a very big part in that. I know you saw Enrico Fermi in the movie, right? Was he, I haven't seen the movie yet, but was he in Chicago when you saw him? Chances are at that point in the movie, he was actually building the first sustainable critical reaction. So when you think about nuclear, anything involving nuclear power, what you need is to fission an atom. So you find some special atoms that are already fairly unstable and then you put them all in the same place when they, when some of them spontaneously fission, they throw off neutrons. You guys know what neutrons are. 
and those neutrons hit other unstable atoms, which causes them to also fission. And in the process of this fissioning, there's a ton of power that's released or a ton of energy that's released. The first time that was ever done in a sustainable way was at this university. It was done under Stag Field, and I'm not quite clear whether Stag Field was a football field or a hockey field at the time, but it was one of those fields. So imagine you guys are going to class and today somebody is doing top secret physics at the bottom of your building. That's what happened here at U Chicago, uh, I guess during the war in the 1940s. So this is a very special place if you're into physics. It is one of the reasons that U Chicago is considered to be one of the most important. And I guess, what would I say here? It's, it has a storied history of contribution to the field. So in addition to the Manhattan Project, the way we got all of the national laboratories is that the government was like, hey, seems like a pretty good idea if we take a bunch of really smart people, we give them a bunch of money and resources, and we put them in a position where they can find out stuff. So you can draw a direct line from the Manhattan Project, even these tools of war, to Adams for Peace. Because without the Manhattan Project and that model of working on things, we wouldn't have Fermilab and the 16 other national laboratories that exist today. So Chicago is pretty fancy. That nuclear reactor was called uh, Chicago Pile One. Once it was built, it only produced about a couple watts of power, which isn't very much. But once it was produced, they then took it apart and they brought it out to where Argonne currently is right now. And they continue to work on that. And Argonne became one of the primary places where we studied nuclear reactors for a while. So by going into Saturday morning physics, by visiting you Chicago, you guys are, are, are walking in the steps of some of the most famous physicists to have ever lived. Do you know that? So we aim to continue that process. We want you guys to feel like you can achieve at that level. And the way we aim to continue it is by making sure that you know that in addition to a place like UChicago, in addition to places like Fermilab, in addition to places like Argonne, Chicago as a city is I'm dubbing and I have gotten from other folks who work on this sort of stuff. I, I'm starting to dub it the city of science because in addition to all these institutions I named, there's a strong tech community here. If you think about um, Google has a place here in Fulton Market. Um, I think Uber's around here somewhere. I think they just took over the old stock exchange building. You know, when you drive in the expressway into the, um, into the city, that building, I think, I think Uber just bought it. There's 1871, there's all sorts of, of maker spaces that you guys can go to and really test your skills outside of the laboratory and or academic context. Um, there's also tons of museums and aquariums. I mean, you guys have been to Shedd Aquarium and the Museum of Science and Industry, I hope. If you haven't, you should go. There's Adler Planetarium. So, um, and this is in addition to other universities like Northwestern. So, I mean, there is a lot of science here if you guys are really interested in figuring it out. And we're trying to position Saturday morning physics as one of the first steps or a node in this network of science that we hope you guys engage in. Because science is cool. I don't know if you guys know, but I'm pretty happy with my life. <laughs> I get up on the Saturday and I come out here and talk with you guys about how cool this is. So, um, is there anything else I wanted to say? Uh, not really. I guess stick around and you'll learn some stuff. Uh, with that, I should probably introduce our speaker. Uh, what, yeah, I guess, so Patty's been around for a while. I think he's the, <laughs> I think at this point he's the head of the, of the, oh, not the head. It's one of the most prominent members of the Fermi Lab Theory Group. So you guys are really getting a heavy hitter to come in here and teach you quantum mechanics, like the, the SMPs of old. Um, Patty, whenever you're ready. Thank you. I'm a theorist, which I'm not issued by Brian, which means that I'm technologically challenged um, when it comes to any piece of shiny equipment, including a laptop. Okay. So before we get started, you guys want to drill? Wait, am I supposed to stand up? Am I supposed to give me a voice? Uh, well, it's helpful. Everybody on Zoom, can you turn off your cameras now so 
you don't show up on the thing. And also at home, after you turn off your camera and you just stand up so that we can engage in our tradition. So you guys should know the drill by now. We're gonna do three large breaths. The reason we do this is to get in the mood to learn. Let's do the first one. Ah, oh, that oh, feels great. Oh, man. A little bit of stress this morning. It's a new thing for us. So let go of that stress. The second one. Turn that out. Oxygen should be going to your brain. Should be waking up. Thank you for getting out of bed. And then let's do the next one. Okay, let out. All right, let's get ready to learn. Thank you. Thanks, Brian. Okay. Uh, as Brian said, I'm going to tell you uh, about quantum mechanics, which is, um, as Leah mentioned, one of the fundamental building blocks of uh, our world to understand physics at the smaller scales. As you drill down and try to understand the, the, the rudimentary constructions of nature, you end up at some point running across quantum mechanics. So my, I'm going to try and tell you a little bit about the um, what is quantum mechanics, the history of quantum mechanics, um, and <clears throat> why a quantum mechanic, somebody who does quantum mechanics uh, tinkers away at atoms like that. Okay, so uh, this is the most important slide of the whole talk. It really is implicit in any physics talk, any talk you see by a physicist. Uh, uh, you should feel free to ask me questions. There are people running around with microphones, but if that uh, impedes the free flow of questions, I'll just repeat any question for people on Zoom. So if there's anybody on Zoom or anybody in the room wants to ask me a question about quantum mechanics or anything to do with physics, just stick your hand up and ask me questions. It's a lot more fun for me if you ask questions, and it might be a, a bit more fun for you if you ask questions. We'll see. Okay. Okay, so here is the challenge uh, of the, the lecture. Um, I'm going to try to tell you about quantum mechanics. And quantum mechanics is very, very strange. It's very weird. And part of the reason it's weird is because we don't run across it in our everyday life, right? Uh, if you look under all the rocks around, you don't quickly run into quantum mechanics. Uh, the, the, the physics way of saying this is that we live in our everyday experiences. We live in a classical world. And uh, uh, what, a, what a physicist means by classical is not that everybody's uh, playing the cello or speaking in Latin or Greek or something. Um, it's uh, uh, that the rules of nature are described by classical physics, which is physics that was written down some time ago by people like Newton uh, and Galileo and Maxwell and people like that who will show on a later slide. Um, is it me that's messing this up or is it some? Okay, I'll just ignore it then. Okay. Um, so our everyday experiences are those of the classical world, the, you know, with how you ride your bicycle around, the, the way the bicycle moves when you put energy into the into the pedals and things is determined by Newtonian physics, by classical physics. We don't in our everyday life run across the physics of Einstein, relativity, which I think you'll hear about in later weeks, or the physics of Schrodinger and his friends, uh, which is the physics of quantum mechanics. So um, because we don't come across it in our everyday life, it's very counterintuitive because our intuition is built on, on our experiences, which are classical in nature. So unfortunately, this is what makes it both a little bit uh, intimidating, a little bit confusing, and also incredibly exciting, is that uh, uh, nothing in your everyday life prepares you for the weirdness that you're about to encounter when I describe quantum mechanics to you. So this may sound like some uh, attempt by me to uh, get my excuses in first, but when I uh, fail to explain something to you, it's not my fault, it's quantum mechanics' fault, but it really is, it's a, um, it's a strange subject. So. We have to put some of our uh, uh, intuition aside and, and follow the evidence down into the quantum mechanics rabbit hole. Okay, so I'm going to use also another cheap trick. Right? I'm going to first of all complain that it's really hard to explain before I try to explain it. And then I'm going to use the cheap trick of appealing to very famous people to convince you that it is confusing. So uh, here are a list of quotes. Um, this one is from Niels Bohr, one of the, the um, grandfathers, if you like, of quantum mechanics. He said, for those who are not shocked when they first come across quantum theory, they cannot possibly have understood it. So if you're not shocked and your mind's not blown, you've not been paying enough attention. Uh, he got a Nobel Prize, not for saying that, but for the work we're going to talk about. Um, uh, John Wheeler said, if you're not completely confused by quantum mechanics, you've not understood it. So sort of in the same vein as uh, Niels Bohr. So expect to be completely confused in the next few hours. But we'll do our best to work through it. 
And uh, Richard Feynman, who also got a Nobel Prize, said, I think I can safely say that nobody understands quantum mechanics. So this is great. Nobody understands it, and I'm supposed to explain it to you. OK, so let's have some fun. Uh, um, so, so what I'll try to do to get us through this journey is I will, um, since it's so weird and you don't come across it in everyday life, the first question you should ask is, how on earth do we know it's out there? How do we discover quantum mechanics? How do we know the world at very, very short distance is not described by the laws of Newton and Maxwell and company? How, is, how do we know it's described by the laws of Schrodinger and company? So how do we discover it? Uh, then I'll try to describe a little bit about what it is, uh, what it is that we discovered, and how we know it's true. And then I'll get into what's going on in the present day and hopefully in the future to do with quantum mechanics. Okay, so let's go back to, so any questions, first of all? No, okay. So I'll go back to uh, what I was saying at the beginning about classical physics. So back when uh, uh, these classical physicists were uh, uh, working, um, they wrote down lots of rules of nature. So this is on the left is Newton, Galileo, and Maxwell, all with similar haircuts. Um, uh, and if you were to collect together the accumulated work of Newton, Galileo, Maxwell, and others, I mean, it's not just three people. The classical physics was developed by many, many people. Uh, but uh, if you were to collect together all their works and study them very, very carefully uh, and uh, um, be presented with a physics problem prior to about 1900, you could probably understand it because uh, uh, the world as we understood it at the time was classical in nature, described by the laws of, of these people. Uh, and one of the common features of the laws of classical physics is that um, the behavior of, of nature is deterministic. So that is to say that you can determine exactly what will happen given the initial conditions and a large enough piece of paper to do your calculations on, right? Given all of that, you can predict what will happen. It's deterministic in nature. So that's one of the common features of classical physics. Okay, so here is uh, one, did it show up okay? Yeah, here is one uh, slide, essentially trying to capture all of class, what I meant by classical physics. So you have optics down on the bottom left, you have planetary motion, uh, gravity, of Newtonian gravity, you know, there's F equals MA up the top there. You've probably seen that in your uh, uh, in your textbooks at school. And that explains how motion, uh, how bodies behave when you push push on them. Uh, up in the top right there is is um, this famous uh, book by Newton called the Principia. It's very very hard to read, but it contains essentially F equals MA and how planets move and things like that in it. It's written in a very archaic way. Um, but if you were to study this carefully. Um, and add thermodynamics in the bottom right, and then Maxwell's equations there, which explain how light behave, you know, how uh, electricity and magnetism work. Uh, these are the laws of classical physics. And as I said, they did a pretty good job of explaining everything we'd observed up to the, around about 1900. Um, and they were deterministic. Okay, so what happened around the turn of the previous century? Uh, so we had uh, uh, people started to take uh, um, more and more precise data, uh, and one uh, they could build interesting systems to study, and they could compare the, the the way physics works. Is there are there are two groups of people in physics? There are experimentalists and theorists, and they're in what I like to call competitive collaboration, in the sense that uh, theorists are dreaming up crazy ideas, and experimentalists are trying to to knock those theorists off their perch and uh, uh, measure things that either refute or uh, disprove theorists' ideas, right? So we're looking, we're both trying to study and understand nature, and we go about it from slight different angles, and we work together in uh, what, like I said, collab competitive collaboration. So um, so one of those objects that you could uh, build and study around the early 1900s is something called a black body. Here's a cartoon of it in the bottom left. So this is an object that essentially absorbs all of the radiation that, that lands on it. And then slowly re-emits it as a it gets it warms up as it absorbs that radiation uh, and it emits uh, heat and you can study the properties of the heat that it emits. So if you like, it's uh, you can see here there's a little um, hole in the corner. Of, yes. Uh, how do you create one? How do you create one? Yeah. Uh, you'd have to ask my experimental colleagues, but essentially you uh, you could imagine this is a lump of metal or a hollowed out lump of metal with a tiny little hole in it. And uh, any light that goes through the hole will bounce around inside for a while, right? Because, you know, it's, it's a tiny little hole. So you just shine light on that hole 
whatever goes in gets absorbed and doesn't come back out. And slowly that light, as it's bouncing around inside, will heat up the metal. And then you can hold a measuring device like a thermometer up against the other side and measure its temperature. But any light that shines on that one side will be absorbed. And you can make them, that's a, a toy example, if you like. But uh, one, as we'll get to, there, there are various black bodies in nature. The sun is a black body to pretty good approximation. Uh, and, and I'll talk about a very good approximation of a black body in a minute. But, but these things, we can build them and they exist uh, in nature as well. Okay, so you can look at uh, uh, the radiation that's re-emitted by this black body and you can, you can measure it. And up here in this big yellow box is a plot of such a thing. So what we do uh, this is a plot of the wavelength of the light along the x-axis and essentially the amount of light that comes out at that wavelength on the y-axis. So um, uh, the red curve is essentially what would happen if you did this experiment and you took the data and you can see that uh, long wavelengths, there's not very much light coming out. And then as you go down in wavelengths, you get more and more light and at some point you reach a maximum and then it drops off again at the very short wavelengths or very high frequencies. Okay, and that's, what a, that's the spectrum of a black body. It's universal uh, and it can be measured in the lab and that's what you get. Uh, however, at the time, if you're a classical physicist, this is a very simple system. I managed to describe it in a few words. So it should be something uh, that's amenable to uh, explanation through the laws of electromagnetism and the laws of thermodynamics and things like that. And uh, uh, so a theorist with a big enough piece of paper could make a prediction to compare to uh, her experimental colleagues' uh, data, right, the, to the red curve. And so sure enough, a theorist did a calculation and they got this purple curve. And there's two things to notice about this purple curve. First, it's nowhere near the red curve. So the theorist is not doing a very good job here. The laws of nature that the theorist understands at the time don't seem to explain the black body. Uh, so it's very far from the red curve, so there's work to be done. But the second thing to notice about this purple curve, which is really where people started to get a hint that their understanding of nature was not complete, is you could ask, what's the total amount of energy that this black body could push out? could uh, uh, emit. And in you, the way you would do that is you would add up all the area under one of these curves, right? So you would add up the, the height of each of these little wavelength pieces and, and, uh, and because there's the amount of energy coming out at 2000 nanometers, you add that to the amount of energy coming out at 3000 nanometers, so on and so forth, you get the total amount of energy. And you can see that the area under the red curve is something, it's finite, but if you were to go ahead and try to calculate the area under the purple curve, you would get a very scary answer. You would get the number infinity. So uh, even before the experimentalist took the data of the black body, the theorists should have known that they were missing something because their calculations at the time would tell them that the this simple object should emit an infinite amount of energy. And this was the beginning of the end of classical physics, as I said at the top of the slide. Uh, it took this man here, Max Planck, to make a pardon the pun, a quantum leap in our understanding. So what he did is he said, that, well, clearly there's, there's lots of problems here with our understanding, the Rayleigh genes law doesn't fit the data and it has this infinity associated with it. So that's not right. How do I fix that? And he made this at the time crazy hypothesis. And here it is. He said, well, up until now in the classical description, we've imagined that light can be emitted from this black body in arbitrarily small amounts. And he says, nope, it can't be. From now on, light can only be emitted in uh, discrete units of energy. And so you can emit no, uh, no light at that particular energy. You can emit one unit, two units, seven units, 100 units, but nothing that isn't an integer. So you can't emit 0.5 of a unit of light at that frequency. You can't emit 1.7. It has to be a discrete amount. And that was the beginning of quantum mechanics. This seemingly crazy idea, if you just... To, forget where it comes from and just apply it, uh, modify the laws that gave you the purple curve and make this assumption that light's emitted and absorbed in quanta, suddenly the purple curve snaps down onto the red curve. And uh, with that one assumption, you fit the, uh, um, the, the experimental data and the, the way nature behaves perfectly. So you asked this question about, about how do you make a black body? So, so uh, that was the beginning of the end of classical physics. And it's always amusing to me that uh, we sort of know that quantum mechanics is the physics of the very, very small. I already said at the beginning, you don't run across it in your everyday life. So it's, it's, we only see it when we delve down to microscopic scales, to atomic scales. 
is when we see uh, quantum mechanics rear its head. But the best black body that we know of is this one here. Uh, this is a plot of data. Uh, and when physicists like to plot data, they always like to plot the data with the uncertainty on their measurement, which we call the error bars. And usually these error bars are things that you see around. So there's the red curve is the data, or the black dots are the data and the red curve is the, the theory fit. And uh, uh, in this case, the error bars have been multiplied by, by, I think, a factor of a few hundred in order for you to be able to see them. So this thing is a perfect black body. And what is this thing? This thing is the measurement of the temperature of the heat left over from the Big Bang that's spread throughout the universe. So the most perfect black body we know of is our entire universe, which of course is not a small thing. Um, and yet it's the black body spectrum was the beginning of our understanding of quantum mechanics, which is the theory of the microscopic. So I just find it sort of ironic that uh, it was black bodies that gave us, tipped us off to quantum mechanics and the best black body we know of is not a small thing, it's, it's the entire universe. Okay, so, um, and you see it has that characteristic shape again. And now all that's changed is the, the wavelength has gone from being a few thousand nanometers as it is in a terrestrial black body to a few millimeters uh, wavelength for the, for the cosmic microwave background data. Um, okay. So uh, with that um, a seemingly crazy uh, hypothesis of Planck's, right? The light can only be emitted and absorbed in discrete units of energy. Uh, you have the birth of quantum mechanics. And when you make um, such a bold statement, if it's true, which it is in this case, you get a new uh, constant of nature named after you. So Planck's constant, this is this H thing here, tells us exactly how to relate. Uh, it tells us, it sort of encodes Planck's uh, hypothesis in equations. And so what it says is, remember he said you can only emit and absorb uh, light in discrete quanta, he called them. And so you should need to ask yourself, how, how much energy is there in a single quanta? And so once I tell you the frequency of light given here by nu, I can convert that to the energy of the quanta by multiplying it by Planck's constant. So it was Planck's idea, he gets the constant named after him. Um, and uh, there it is in uh, all of its uh, numerical glory um, in the middle of the screen. So it's a very, very small number, right? It's 6.6, 6, well, it's 34 zeros, zero dot 34 zeros, 6.66, 6, 6, right? Joule seconds in those units. So that is the amount of energy in one of those quanta that uh, Planck was saying had to be emitted and absorbed discreetly uh, from the, the black body. Uh, so that's a very, very small number. And, and maybe it's too early on a Saturday morning to appreciate how small that number is. So we're going to do a homework problem because that's the only way a theorist understands anything is to do homework problems. So, um, and the, the, the question we're going to ask ourselves, which is why, is it, why did it take so long to notice there were quanta right there is related to this number being very, very small. So um, probably none of these light bulbs are of the type shown in this picture, but we can ask ourselves a question. If light is emitted and absorbed in finite units, how many finite units are typically emitted and absorbed in our everyday life? So how many quanta are bouncing around this room right now? So we can just use the, the formula that, that uh, uh, Planck gave us to figure it out. So here's a light bulb, an old fashioned light bulb. Uh, this is you know, one of these old incandescent bulbs and it has the one virtue that is the only picture on Google Images where you can see the wattage, the power that this light bulb uh, takes. So you look very, very carefully. You can see it's a 12 volt light bulb with 100 watts. It kicks out or it draws 100 watts of power. Uh, it doesn't put out 100 watts of light, uh, but I don't think I took that into account. Um, okay, so we can ask ourselves, how many quanta is this light bulb putting out per second? So it puts out, uh, um, you know that old joke, what's the unit of power? Right, so it is. Um, so it puts out uh, 100 watts, which is 100 joules of energy per second. And Planck told us how much a single quanta of light, uh, how much energy a single quanta of light contains. So we can quickly calculate how many quanta of light this light bulb is pushing out per second. As long as we know one thing, and this is where I got some audience participation, does anybody know the wavelength of, or frequency? It's probably easier in wavelength of light that our eyes typically see. Anybody? Yes. Perfect. 400 to 700 nanometers, I think is right. Uh, 
And it's even, the number I picked was 600 nanometers. So it fits right in that window. So that's perfect. So here you go. Uh, we want it, so that was, you gave me the wavelength of light, but Planck's formula needs the frequency. So we have to convert a wavelength to a frequency, which is a fairly straightforward thing to do once we know the speed of light. So you gave me four to 700 nanometers. I'm gonna pick 600 because it makes the numbers easier. Um, so with 600 nanometer of light, the frequency of light is five times 10 to the 14 Hertz. Okay, so that's the new in uh, Planck's formula. There's the H, so you multiply those two numbers together and you get the, uh, an individual quantum of light is about 10 to the minus 19 joules. And then we already said this light bulb puts out about a hundred joules a second. That was, we all know light bulbs are not really efficient. So they put out like one joule per second, most of it in light, most of it comes out in heat. Um, uh, so in visible light, they put out, uh, so, so you can divide one number by the other, and you see that the number of uh, quanta that the uh, light bulb is putting out per second is about 10 to the 20. So that is why we never noticed, right? That's why it was really hard to notice that light was not continuous, that light was coming in discrete bunches, because you'd have to count an enormous number to be able to see that they were coming uh, uh, discreetly. It's for the same reason it took us so long to realize we're built from atoms. Because you take any lump of material, you can just keep cutting it in half and cutting it in half and cutting it in half. And you seem to be able to divide it up arbitrarily into arbitrarily small amounts. It's not until you have a very, very powerful microscope that you realize nature is actually built from indivisible atoms, right? It's the same thing for quanta. We thought that we could emit and absorb radiation in any amount we wanted. And it's only when you do very, very careful observations that allow you to get down to the precision of like these types of numbers, one part in 10 to the 20, that you start to notice that it isn't infinitely, indivis infinitely divisible, that in fact, it comes in discrete bundles. And that's why it took us so long to know this quantum machine. Questions? Yes. Uh, yes, yeah, so the question, for those of you on Zoom, the question was, does light come in chunks? And that's essentially what I'm saying, that's right. And we'll see what that implies as we go through this lecture. But yeah, light comes in, in, in uh, yeah, units, quanta, yeah. So that leads me nice, unless there are more questions, which I would, would be great. Yes. What was the N? Was the N? Yeah. Oh, sorry, I didn't explain it well enough. Okay, so the N here is the number of quanta put out per second, because what's, what's happening is I'm taking the power of the light bulb, which is 100 joules per second. So that's how much energy in a second it, it puts out. And I divided that by the energy in a single quanta. So now I know how many quanta it puts out in a second. So and it was, was this enormous number, right? Three with 20 zeros after. Anybody else? Yes. What if that plane come up with like that light? Oh, that's a great question. Uh, the question was, what, what made Planck make this crazy hypothesis? Uh, and I honestly don't know. And I'm, I think it was a guess. But, that, but a guess plus serendipity equals science, right? So, I mean, you, you, you make a hypothesis and you see where it leads you. And sometimes it leads you in the right direction and sometimes it doesn't. And in this case, he was onto something big. Yeah. Anybody else? I thought I saw another hand go up, but maybe I had the same question. Okay. Great. Keep the questions coming. I love it. Okay. So that was the beginning of the end of classical physics was that experiment with the black body. And now I'll tell you about another experiment that was the end of the end of classical physics. Um, and that's the uh, photoelectric effect. So the photoelectric effect is um, this phenomenon that if you take a lump of metal and you uh, shine the right type of light on it, you can essentially get electron. Oop, sorry, you can get electron. I'll step back, I'm getting to the hand waving stage of the lecture. Um, uh, if you shine the right type of light on a piece of metal, you uh, can get electrons to come out of the surface of that metal. You essentially boil electrons off the metal. Uh, but the, the exact relationship between the light and the electrons that come out is very, very intriguing. Um, so here is a cartoon of the experiment. There you see on the right uh, a piece of metal, uh, and then they irradiate it with some light, uh, and then they can control the, it, it, sorry, I should say this is a, inside this glass tube that contains the, the piece of metal, it's a vacuum. So uh, there's no air in there, there's, no, there's just the metal and the, the detector surface. So any electrons that come off the metal when it gets uh, light shone on it, can move around freely. They don't bang into gas atoms or anything. 
And so you can irradiate the piece of metal and then you can control what the electrons do by setting up a potential difference inside the, the vacuum tube. And then you can measure uh, how many electrons come off the surface of the metal or whether any electrons come off the surface of the metal. And so you see down there the, the general idea, right? There's light shining on a piece of metal and metal contains electrons inside it. And if the light has the right properties, you can get some of those electrons to come out of the metal. So there's a, there's a, a Hertz and Millikan did this experiment and they noticed uh, a series of, uh, of relationships. So first of all, they noted the one I started out by we're saying that if you irradiate the metal, so that's fancy physics words for shine light on it. If you irradiate the metal, electrons can come out of the metal. They noticed that the um, whether electrons came out, whether or not electrons bought off metal depended on the exact frequency of the light. Sometimes if the frequency was too low, no electrons came out. And once they crossed a certain threshold uh, in the frequency, then electrons started to come out. The number of electrons that came out, the current, depended on the brightness of the light, uh, at, but the energy at which the electrons came out, so the, the essentially the speed at which they came out the metal, uh, depended upon the frequency of the light. And uh, so these, these are all uh, interesting observations, right? And then they took these observations and they compared it to their model they had of light at the time. So remember, the, these, these are essentially, they're trying to apply the laws of classical physics. So what was light? Light was described by uh, the laws of Maxwell. It was electromagnetic radiation. It was a wave that traveled through uh, through space. And uh, light was supposed to be a wave-like phenomenon. And it was supposed to be described by uh, waves. So um, there were waves of light hitting the metal and kicking electrons out of the metal. So now I'm going to give you an analogy uh, for what's going on, so you can try to maybe see why the, the wave story does not explain these observations. So imagine you go on holiday to a beach, uh, and it, or go on holiday to a small island, and it has two beaches, one on the north side of the island and one on the south side of the island. Because of the prevailing weather conditions, uh, the, the surf is different on the two sides of the island. On one side of the island, uh, there are high frequency waves, so the waves are coming in, let's say, every 10 seconds. and But they're relatively small waves. They're 10 centimeters in height. And on the other side of the island, there are very low frequency waves. They come in once an hour, but they're really, really big. They're five meters in height. OK, so on one side, there's a high amplitude, low frequency wave. And on the other side, there is a high frequency, low amplitude wave. And then I ask you, which place would you rather go for a swim in or stand on the beach or something? And which, which side is safer? And I think you'd all agree that the safer side, the one where there's less likely to, if you're standing in the surf zone, you're less likely to get knocked over or pushed around is the one with the high frequency, low amplitude waves, right? So that's the one where there's less energy being given to you. And that's exactly what you would think of going on here with the light as well, right? We're trying to knock electrons out of the metal, which is the same as knocking you over when you're uh, on, the, uh, on the beach. And it sounds like the high amplitude, the amplitude is the important part and not the frequency. But you notice here that the electrons being emitted depended entirely on the frequency and not really on the amplitude, right? They, they got electrons to come out of the metal only when the frequency was high enough. If the frequency was too low, nothing happened. And the amount, uh, the speed at which the, uh, the electrons were boiled off the metal depended on the frequency of the light. The only thing that depended upon the brightness of the light was the number of electrons that were emitted. So they were, their minds were blown by this because uh, uh, they thought photons, the, the light, uh, uh, another word for light, um, was supposed to be described by waves. And from the analogy with the waves on the beach, we know that wave phenomena could not explain these observations that they made with the photo photoelectric effect. And so this gets back to the question you asked. So they, they, they realized that the only way to explain the things they were seeing was if, uh, and it took this gentleman here, uh, you may have heard of him, uh, uh, it took him to get involved in the game to really uh, uh, get us all to understand it. So Albert Einstein decided not only was the energy emitted in lumps, but the actual light behaves as if it is, as you said, a discrete bundle. It's actually like a particle-like object. It has, it, it looks not like a wave, but like a particle, at least as far as the photoelectric effect is concerned. So for the photoelectric effect to be explained, uh, you had to treat the incoming light as individual particles 
each of which had an energy determined by the Planck's, uh, by Planck's constant in this relationship we looked at. Uh, and whether they emitted an electron out of the, at, uh, out of the metal was uh, dependent on their frequency because the frequency determined the amount of energy each one of these light particles brought to the game. And of course, these electrons are held in the metal. They don't really want to leave the metal. So you have to give them enough energy to break the bonds. And then once you have enough energy to break the bonds, any extra energy makes them come out faster. So that the whole, um, all the phenomena could be explained if you made this one crazy hypothesis that goes against, you know, 1900 years of understanding that light was a wave. If you said, no, light's not a wave, it's secretly a particle, then the photoelectric effect all makes sense. But you have to go through, you have to go through that one uh, uh, um, change of paradigm to, to give me it all make sense. Yes. So you, right, so you, you're boiling off electrons and you're leaving behind the nuclei, the, the rest of the atom, or, or an atom minus a few of its electrons, so that over time the metal becomes positively charged. And so if you try to do this in a, in a confined environment, eventually you wouldn't be able to get any more out because the positive charge left behind would be pulling the electrons back too strongly. You would reach some sort of equilibrium where you would have uh, the light would be able to boil a few off, but some would be pulled back and, you know, it would reach a thermodynamic equilibrium. Yes. Yes, yes, light is uh, affected by gravity, uh, just like all other forms of energy and matter. And in fact, this guy here, Albert Einstein, uh, uh, made some predictions that were later confirmed that light would bend the, 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 direct, the, the path that light takes would bend in the background of a gravitational field. And so around about 1919, they did this great experiment because there was a solar eclipse that was happening. And so we could look at our sun, directly at our sun without getting blinded because the moon was in the way. And that allowed us to see background stars that we don't normally see uh, when the sun is in that position because, because the sun is too bright to see these dim background stars. And so they compared the position of these stars when the sun was in the way to when the sun wasn't in the way, and they saw they moved. And they moved for exactly the reason you said. So the light coming from the star to our eyes was bent by the uh, gravitational potential of the, of the sun. Yes, so you're exactly right. Mm -hmm. There's one question <clears throat> from the chat. I'll, I also can pass this mic around for questions. It's hard to get to all the hands. But could you explain the equation shown in this slide? The equation shown in this slide. Yes, sure. Um, there's nothing a theorist loves more than explaining an equation. So thank you for that. Must be somebody I know online. Um, okay, so so this is uh, this is basically trying to capture the statement I was saying that the frequency of the light is what determines whether electrons come out of the metal. So the as I said, there there are electrons in metal, but they're held in inside the metal by uh, bonds to the rest of the atoms in the metal. And we encode the strength of that bond by this W. It's called the work function, right? So W is the amount of energy you have to give to an electron to be able for it to break its bonds and leave the metal. And then this H new thing here is the amount of energy the quanta of light has, as we saw from the Planck's constant and the law that we introduced earlier. So you can ask how much energy is left over, right? So you give me H new of energy from the quantum of light hitting the metal. It has to use W of it up, it has to overcome the work function, and anything extra will go into giving the electron some speed. So the left-hand side here is just the kinetic energy of an electron. Right? It's a half mv squared. I hope uh, you've seen that in class, that that's kinetic energy. And so, uh, so this, and then this plot here is basically encoding that formula. So you can measure how much energy the electron has by subtracting the work function from the incoming light energy and then the leftover is the speed. And sure enough, I mean, you know that speed has to be uh, bigger than zero, right? So the left-hand side has to be positive. And so you need this frequency to be bigger than W divided by H, which is why in this plot, nothing is happening until you hit a certain frequency, until you've crossed that threshold. Hope that helps. Okay. So the, to explain the photoelectric effect, light has to be a particle. But that doesn't mean that all of classical physics up until then was wrong, right? So there are instances and situations in which the wave description is a good description. 
basically all the physics we've seen up until the photoelectric effect. And then there are other instances where you need to understand that, that light is a, can be described as a particle. And this is called the, the wave particle duality, right? Then uh, uh, now imagine you are such a photon, how confusing your life would be, right? Uh, don't even know your frequency. Am I an X-ray uh, photon or a radio photon? Am I invisible? Am I a particle? Am I a wave? What am I? Um, and uh, um, and thanks to quantum mechanics, uh, it's both at the same time. Okay, so um, so that was uh, taking something that we previously thought of as a wave and discovering that in some situations it behaves as a particle. So you're led to the natural question that I think you might have been alluding to with your gravity question, is if a wave can become a particle, can a particle become a wave? And uh, de Broglie here, another uh, Nobel Prize winner, uh, tried to understand exactly that. Is there a way in which um, uh, we can think of particles now as being waves? And he did uh, uh, some fantastic mathematical gymnastics and arrived at a very, very interesting conclusion. So um, when you do special relativity, you're going to learn that the formula that, that Einstein is famous for isn't quite right. It's not really E equals MC squared. It's really E squared equals M squared plus P squared. Uh, um, but for a particle like light, what it tells you is that the momentum and the energy of the particle are basically the same thing. Up to some factors of the speed of light, the momentum for a, for a light particle, and that's the first formula here, the momentum is equal to the energy of the light, okay? So even though it has no rest mass, it can have momentum. And then we already know from a previous uh, slide that uh, Planck told us that the energy of a light particle is related to its frequency by using his constant. Right? So that's the next formula, E is equal to H nu. And then we've already talked about how you can relate a frequency to the speed of light, right? The frequency times the wavelength is equal to the speed of light. So there I have a frequency in the numerator, a speed of light in the denominator, I do some cancellation and I end up with the wavelength in the denominator. So for light, I can write down this chain of equations that are all totally correct and there's no um, sleight of hand, okay? And then what de Broglie said was, well, that's all great and everything, but um, what if I forget that I'm talking about light and I just look at the first part of the equation and the last part of the equation? So it says, if you look at it, it says that momentum is equal to Planck's constant divided by wavelength, which is true for light. But we know other things that have momentum, like you have momentum when you're walking down the road, you have momentum when you're riding your bicycle. So if I just think of momentum, this is a formula for converting momentum into wavelength. Does that mean that anything with momentum has wavelength? And so therefore things that are particle-like, like you and me, do they have a wavelength? And indeed they do. And it's such a weird concept. It's called the de Broglie wavelength of a particle named after Louis de Broglie who came up with the idea. Um, and uh, uh, so, so even though he did all of the formulas correctly for light, at the end of the day, he decided that it should apply more broadly and he was correct. Um, and so you can ask yourself again, why did I not come across quantum, quantum mechanics in my everyday life? What, why have I not noticed? I would think I would notice if I was a wave and not a particle. So why have I not noticed that I'm waving? Um, uh, so we can calculate your de Broglie wavelength, okay? And if you put in some standard numbers, you know, for how much a human weighs and how fast they go on a bicycle or something like that, and that would determine the left-hand side, the momentum, and then the other numbers we, we know from earlier, you can work out your de Broglie wavelength. And if I did the maths right last night, um, for a, a human on a bicycle, your de Broglie wavelength is very, very, very small. Right, that's way smaller than the size of a nucleus in an atom, which is why you've not noticed you're waving, right? Your de Broglie wavelength is very, very short. To be able to see that wavelength would require incredible uh, technology and, and uh, very, very precise measurements and, and things like that in a lab. You can't just see it in everyday life. But I'm going to try to convince you in the rest of this talk that you are indeed waving, okay? Uh, and so I think, I'll try to get through this slide and then uh, uh, we'll pause for a wee while. Um, so this leads us to the quintessential experiment associated with um, quantum mechanics. And it's, in its original incarnation, this was a Gedanken experiment, which is German for thought experiment. And we'll see why in a minute it was a Gedanken experiment. But let me describe um, the experiment to you. So uh, here we have on the left, 
a uh, uh, like a, a machine that shoots ball bearings, a little BB gun thing that, that fires ball bearings at a piece of wood in which I've cut two narrow slits. And behind it, I have a wall coated in putty or something such that when a ball bearing hits it, it sticks. And I can leave this machine running and I can go away and come back a few hours later and ask what is the pattern of ball bearings stuck to the wall, right? And I think you'd all agree that if I did this experiment, I would end up with a pattern like that. I'd end up with two patches of ball bearings sort of lined up behind the slit and maybe a few stray ball bearings that bounced off the walls of the, of the slits or something sprinkled around on the rest of the screen, on the rest of the putty, but uh, basically two bright bands of ball bearing and not much else. And then I could set up a very similar experiment where I move the, the two slits and put them in my bathtub, right, which I fill up with water. And then I drop pebbles or something or tap the surface of the bathtub such that I send out ripples on the surface of the water, uh, shown here in this, these black ripples. They spread out, right? And these ripples, when they encounter the, the gap, they, they, when they encounter the solid part of the, of the pieces of wood, they don't get through. And when they encounter the, the, the gaps, they, they go through as, as waves. And now I have essentially two sources of waves on the other side. Right? And then if I had a device for measuring the heights of waves on the, on the edge of the bathtub, some way of, of recording it, I would find places where two peaks arrived at the bathtub at the same time, and there was an extra large wave on the side of the bathtub. There'd be other places where one peak and one trough arrived at the same time, and they would cancel out, and another place where two troughs arrived at the same time, and the wave would be twice as low. So I would have a pattern of high and low points of the waves on the edge of the bathtub, and that pattern is called an interference pattern because there's two sources of waves now and they interfere with one another, okay? So you can see that the way the waves make it through this double slit is very different from the way particles make it through this double slit, okay? The particles either go through one side or the other and hit the wall. The wave has this ability to go through both sides at the same time because the wave front moves up and hits the gap and then moves through the two gaps and then interferes with itself on the other side. So we can see that um, particles, BB, you know, little ball bearings or something, classical particles like bullets, they behave one way, waves behave the other way. Uh, like I said, that's called an interference pattern. So now we can repeat the experiment with electrons. So we can build, these days at least, we can build something equivalent to this uh, ball bearing gun I described, but for electrons. Okay, so now it shoots individual electrons across a vacuum in which I've put a, a, a double slit. And we can ask, what would happen with these electrons? So electrons, I mean, they're pretty small things. We think of them as particles. So you would think they either get to go through one side of this slit or the other side. And so, and we have a device now, which is not built of putty. It's a screen that uh, flashes whenever electrons hit it. So we have a device for recording where the electrons hit on the other side. So you can repeat the experiment in the lab now, uh, rather than in your basement, but with electrons. And what you find is that, right? So you find that you have this uh, electron gun now firing electrons, and indeed you get individual hits on the screen like you would with ball bearings. But if you observe for long enough, the arrangement of those hits has this pattern that's indicative of waves. It's called an interference pattern. Okay, so you get individual hits. So an individual particle goes through your experiment one at a time, and yet the pattern that arrives at the detector is one as if a wave went through. And this again is this wave particle duality of quantum mechanics. This only happens because quantum mechanics is weird. Um, there you go, the first person who did the experiment right there. Um, and so the obvious question is waves of what, right? What's waving? These are a tiny, tiny little electrons, little balls of charge. And uh, uh, they're being fired one at a time in this experiment through this arrangement. And yet they're interfering somehow and giving you this distinctive pattern on the detector of, an, of a, of a wave-like phenomenon. Okay, and now um, I will attempt to play a movie just to convince you uh, that, I mean, as I said, I'm a theorist, right? So I could be making all this up, but uh, um, uh, here is an actual experiment doing uh, far more carefully what I just described as pieces of wood and whatnot. So um, I don't think we need to, so there are some captions. So what they're doing is uh, 
they have they're firing electrons one at a time through a double slit experiment and then they have a detector on the other side a phosphorescent screen and they're taking a video recording of that phosphorescent screen and uh, um, they're collecting in these flashes of light are individual electrons hitting the screen okay <clears throat> Uh, and biprism here is a fancy word for the double slit. Um, so you would naively think if you believe that electrons were particles that you would just get, you know, two bands or maybe just a uniform distribution, something like that. And now we speed up the film because actually these experiments can take hours. Um, and you can see if you look very carefully, maybe the light isn't perfect. I don't know. I can see it just back. Can you see interference patterns up there? It's way clearer on my monitor, unfortunately. Um, but you can see that there are bands of bright uh, dots. That's where a lot of flashes have all occurred in the same place. Oh, there you go. It's even better now. Ah, thanks, Brian. So I think you wouldn't disagree that there are interference patterns up there now, right? There are these individual electrons, one at a time, went through this uh, um, setup and resulted over time, once you accumulate all the images, of giving you an interference pattern, which is associated with a wave. Okay, uh, good. So I'm gonna leave you with that. And we're gonna have a break in just a second and I'll stay up front. You can ask me any questions you want, but I wanna tell you a tiny little bit about why uh, I described it as you know pieces of wood and stuff. And the, the original fantasy of quantum mechanics called this a Gedanken experiment. Uh, and now we have a movie of somebody doing it for real. And the, the reason is, is because those numbers we talked about are all so small, right? So in order to see this interference pattern, you need to have built uh, these two slits to be separated by pretty much the wavelength of the wave that's interfering. And uh, uh, since we say that the Broglie wavelengths are gonna be the things that interfere, and we saw that the Broglie wavelengths can be very, very short, um, even for something which has very low momentum, like an electron, the de Broglie wavelength is very short. So in order to be able to see this interference pattern, you have to be able to build a two slits separated by a very, very small amount. And in particular, for an electron coming out of an electron gun, the de Broglie wavelength is pretty much comparable to the distance between atoms in a crystal. So to, this is a very non-trivial experiment to do, and it took us a long time to do it for real. But sure enough, when we did it, it confirmed the predictions of quantum mechanics that electrons are described by a wave. And that wave, like all waves, can interfere when it goes through uh, gaps and lead to interference patterns and uh, very non-trivial uh, behavior associated with waves. So sure enough, electrons are uh, waves just like, so electrons which were previously was a particle under quantum mechanics is a wave, just like light, which was previously a wave on the quantum mechanics can be a particle. And now I have a lot of questions. So let's go for questions. Yes. So the question was, what happens as you move the, uh, the, the, the spacing of the two slits around? So as you move them, uh, uh, if you move them too far apart, you lose the interference pattern. And if you, if you move them closer together, the interference pattern is there and it gets wider actually on the screen. And then you can even do this, believe it or not, with a single slit, but you get something then called a diffraction pattern, not an interference pattern. But as you move them closer together, you get a combination of diffractive patterns and interference patterns. But the phenomenon still occurs. Uh, if you go the other way is the problem, they're too far apart. There was a question, yes. Uh, so the phenomenon that you pointed out is is uniform. The exact details of how it drops off with distance depends upon the particle. It, it's again related to this diffraction pattern. So if you do it with light, just you know, you you, you might even do this in high school. You can do this with a, a biprism and things. Um, you'll see a, a, a diffraction pattern overlaid on top of the interference pattern. So it's an interference pattern with diminishing brightness as you go out. And the, the rate at which it diminishes is determined by the wavelength of the light. So in this case, it's determined by the wavelength of the particle, the de Broglie wavelength, which is determined by the momentum. Yeah. More questions? 
All right. Well, uh, Brian, you're the MC. So how long do we have an intermission for? Okay, everybody. So thanks for all the questions. If you have some more detailed ones, you can <laughs> hang out during the intermission. Patty will be around. Yeah. Um, so what time is it? It's about 10.05. Let's come back at 10.20. Okay. We'll get a drink of water, use the bathroom, touch grass. <laughs> <laughs> and I'll stay up here to answer any questions you have. Oop. Yeah. Thank you. 
Okay, everybody. We should be getting back to our seats. We should also be pushing forward. If you're in the back, I need you to stand up. If you're in the back, I need you to stand up. I need you to move it forward. Move it forward. All right, couple other things, some logistics things. Uh, we in the in the in the flurry today, uh, we forgot to take care of attendance. So before you leave, I'm gonna be around here with a laptop taking attendance. Please come see me if you would like your attendance logged. Please. If you do not talk to me and tell me the, your name and to log your attendance, you will not be recorded for today. One other thing, so I just want to remind you that we are at the Southside Science Festival as well. It's happening right outside. So what we would like you to do after this, after the lecture, is to have fun at the South Science at the Southside Science Festival. We're also working out possibly taking a picture with the director. Um, she is very excited to have you guys here. So um, we're going to give you more details on that once we figure it out ourselves. Um, other than that, I think it's good for you to take it, Patty. Okay, great. Thank you. Do I need to show this audio? Okay. <clears throat> okay. So thanks for all the great questions in the intermission. Um, so uh, let's kick off. I think some of the questions were, were uh, preempting things I'm going to say. So... Clearly, I've, I've sowed enough seeds that uh, uh, we should press on. Okay. <laughs> Excuse me. So what's waving, right? So I think uh, we talked about how the history of quantum mechanics lets a wave become a particle and a particle become a wave. Uh, what on earth's going on? What is it that's waving? What is the thing that's interfering in, uh, in the case of the electrons going through the double slit experiment? So at the core of uh, quantum mechanics is something called the wave function. So you already see the clue is in the name, right? It's a wave. And it's so important that I use the largest font I could find uh, to denote it here. And it's typically denoted by the Greek letter psi. And it's, it's like I said, it's, it's the uh, big thing that's doing all the heavy lifting in quantum mechanics. And what it tells us is that we should think of particles or waves and light as being described by a quantum mechanical wave function. And a wave function is, it's this thing here, it, you give me a position and a time and it tells me something about the, the physics that's going on. And it tells me something a little bit different from what classical physics used to tell me. Right, so in classical physics, if I arrange some snooker balls on a snooker table and start one rolling, I tell you the position of the ball and the velocity it has and you can work out where it will be later. Okay, the wave function is sort of the same thing. You tell me the wave function now. I'll show you an equation in a minute that allows me to determine the wave function in the future. But the wave function is not something we directly measure, right? Unlike the um, position of a snooker ball on a snooker table, you can just look at it and see where it is. The wave function is a little bit more complicated and it gives you access to a little bit less direct information. So what it gives you access to is the probability for a particle to be at a particular place at a particular time. So if I have the wave function and I've done some calculation to allow me to work out what the wave function for a particle is, I have to square the wave function. And then once I've squared it, that tells me the chance of something happening. So this is very different, right? In classical physics, we never talked about probabilities. We said classical physics was deterministic. And now it seems that uh, quantum mechanics is suddenly not deterministic, but that's not the case. Quantum mechanics is a deterministic probabilistic theory. So in other words, we can determine there are precise laws that tell you exactly how the wave function behaves in any circumstance. However, the wave function only tells you the chance of something happening. It doesn't tell you that anything will happen guaranteed. It tells you that there's a list of probabilities and it tells you the chance of any one of those things happening. 
So you can use quantum mechanics to predict what will happen on average, but you can't use it to predict what will happen on any one particular occasion. And that's a big change from classical physics. So like I said, the evolution is deterministic, but predictions are only statistical in nature. Yes. Right, so for those on Zoom, the question was, is that why electron clouds exist? Because you can't determine exactly where they are. And uh, um, yes and no. I mean, I, we don't know exactly where electrons are and we think of them as in a cloud, but I think that's really because we're trying to impose our classical language on a quantum system. So really at the quantum level, the electron is described by a, a, a hydrogen atom is described with an electron having a wave function. And we know precisely what that wave function is, but again, it doesn't tell us where the electron is at any particular moment. It tells us that there's a probability it's in this region, right? And that's uh, and a smaller probability it's in this region and so on and so forth. And I'll show you a picture of that in a minute. But, and that's what we mean by the cloud, right? It's, it could be anywhere in, right, in that region. Okay, so now the Schrodinger equation. So here it is. Um, it looks pretty awful, right? It looks scary. There's lots of symbols in there, but I only show it to convince you that we have uh, control, right? We have an equation that we can solve that determines how the wave function behaves. Uh, and, and so that's what I mean by being um, deterministic. And, and, and it's, it's a, what, what physicists call a wave equation. It describes wave-like phenomena. And again, we knew that was going to happen because we did the double slit experiment. And we saw interference in a quantum mechanical system. Um, uh, and I think I've said that already. We only like to ask questions like uh, the probability of something happening. So there's a few parts in this, right? So you see the psi, that's the wave equation. Uh, sorry, the wave function, right? The psi. You see H's, right? So that's Planck's constant. Here I've, I've done what is done in the field these days. And there's a thing called H with a line through it. We call it H bar. It's just got some factors of two pi taken into account, but it's not important. But you see that there's H is appearing, right? So already you know it's got something to do with quantum mechanics because it has Planck's constant in it. It has a wave function. And then it has this last thing at the end, V. And that's a, basically an, it encodes all of the rest of the stuff that's going on. So it tells me, wh what is my electron? Is it, is it uh, moving through a double slit? Is it inside an atom? Is it on its own in the edge of the universe somewhere, just minding its own business? That's all encoded in the V. Uh, and so given that V, which tells me about the environment the particle finds itself in, I can solve this equation and uh, figure out the physics. So, yes. Sure. Um, is that delta size like XCC or Ah, you're asking, you want me to get to go even further into the nitty gritty? Ah, very good. So this is not a, these are not the same symbol. This is a, uh, this is a calculus uh, equation. So this, this, oh. with, this is the partial derivative yeah. of psi with respect to T. And then on the other side, the second partial derivative of psi with respect to X. So there's a lot of calculus in this equation that I don't want to get into. Uh, but I wanted to show it to show that, I mean, the equation that you write down to describe how electrons behave fits on one transparency, right? So it's a little scary, but not super scary. But the real point for showing it is to, to convince you that, that um, quantum mechanics is still deterministic, that the thing we determine is not a thing we directly measure. Yes. So the VFX describes the environment. Correct. Yeah. So just to convince you that it's not super scary, I'm going to do your first quantum mechanics homework problem for you. Write this down, you'll get full marks in your first quantum mechanics homework. Um, so I'm going to describe, you know, when you do classical mechanics, right, when you're first introduced to F equals MA and all that good stuff to do with Newton's laws and things, they probably make you solve, at least they did when I went to school, they made me solve endless problems about blocks sliding down inclined planes with pulleys and ball, anyway. So... If you like, this is the quantum mechanics equivalent of the block sliding down the inclined plane, right? It's the simple homework problem that everybody gives you. But I'm only solving a homework problem because I think it illustrates some of the features of quantum mechanics. And it's easy enough to solve without equations. So why is it easy enough to solve without equations? Because um, 
if you were uh, around in the early 1900s and you saw this equation in modulo the h bars and things, you would look at this and say, this is a wave equation. This describes how violin strings behave, how guitar strings behave, how water waves behave. So I know how to solve that. And sure enough, there's a problem for a particle trapped in a box. So here's my particle trapped in a box up there, which is to say that it's it's really trapped on a table and it can only move in one direction. It can move forwards and backwards along this table. And it, when it reaches the edge, it bounces off and goes back. That's all it does. Just in a one dimensional motion, it can go backwards and forwards. It's trapped, it can never leave the box, okay? And uh, so the V that you will write down, I'm not gonna write it down for you, but it has a, has a set of rules in it. And it basically says, the particle can't leave the box, right? So the probability, remember we're solving for the probability, the probability for the particle to be outside the box is zero, okay? And then this is like a uh, an equation that describes guitar string vibration. So we all know that if you take a guitar string and hold the two ends clamped down at the end of the, uh, uh, the string, there's only certain modes that we can pluck on the guitar string that work, right? There's all these standing modes. You can pluck the string in the middle and then the string wobbles up and down at very low frequency, or you can pluck it somewhere else and you get like two wobbles inside the string. But because the string is held down at the two ends, there's only certain um, oscillations that can fit on the guitar string. And the same is true for the particle in the box because the formulas are the same, but we don't care about the formula. We just care about this picture. So, so here it is on the left, you see uh, the box, right? It goes from zero to L. And then there's all these different waves that can fit inside the box. We know the waves have to be zero outside the box because the particle's trapped. And as I said, there's just various oscillations the wave can have that fit inside the box. And they're, they're listed from the lowest mode where there's just one hump and you've plucked it in the middle, or there's one entire wave, two, a, a hump and a trough, or two humps, one trough, so on and so forth, right? And you know from your experience with guitars, violins, whatever, uh, skipping ropes, whatever it is that you can put oscillations into, um, that as you go up, the frequency is going up, right? And we know from Planck that as frequency goes up, energy goes up, right? So we all, already we're understanding the quantum mechanical description of a particle in a box without solving any equation. And so what you have here are the first four wave functions uh, like I said, and they, they have increasing energy and it works out in this case that the energy of the lowest one, as it, so the energy of the first one is four times as energetic as the energy of the lowest one. And the next one is nine times and 16 times. So you see it grows as a square, okay? Um, and this is the wave function. But of course the wave function is not the thing we measure, right? We measure the square of the wave function, which is the probability for finding the particle somewhere. So in the next picture, is the square of the wave function, which tells you the probability. So if I gave you a hundred of these boxes and I said, I've, they're all the same, okay? Uh, I've put the particle in the same energy state in the box, but I'm gonna allow you to open each box one at a time. So you could uh, start to do, uh, take data. And over time with enough boxes, you could work out which energy state the particle was in. But from a single experiment alone, you cannot. So let's imagine I give you these 100 boxes and you open the first one and you find the particle pretty close to the middle of the box when you open it. So you would say, oh, look, it might be in the first energy state because there's a higher probability that the particle's in the middle of the box, right? This is a this plot here is the probability of where you find it and it's peaked in the middle. So a, it could be the first mode, but it could also be the third mode because the third mode has a peak in the middle. It probably isn't the second mode because the second mode has a trough in the middle. So that's a low chance of finding the particle there. So by opening the first box and seeing the particle roughly in the middle, you've kind of got rid of half the possibilities, but there's still a lot of possibilities. So you open another box and another box, and another box and so on and so forth. And after time, just like the flashes on the screen that we saw, right? After time, you get an accumulated uh, list of information about where you're finding the particles in the box. And that will essentially map out this probability distribution for you and allow you to determine the wave function. Okay, so the wave function determines what you see, but from one observation alone, you cannot determine the wave function. And that's because of this weird thing that uh, quantum mechanics is probabilistic. Yes, MC. I actually have a question. I was thinking about this. Okay, great. This is going to be a tricky one. Yeah. So, if a 
Yeah, the wave function is by real. You mean physical? Yeah, yeah. So I've, 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 as always, I've swept a little bit under the rugs. There are instances in which you have access to the wave function. Yeah, our Anahov bomb effect is one. Yeah, but in almost, but it's a very, very specialized case. You need to do, uh, and you really only have access to the phase of the wave function. Mm -hmm. Oh, the wave function is a real thing for sure. Yeah. Okay, cool. Thank you. So, um, yeah, so Brian was asking, so, so these are just words, right? What, what is the wave function something physical or is it just a tool for encoding uh, the physics? And it really is something physical. I mean, it also encodes the physics. So you get a little bit into philosophy. I mean, what is what is the mathematics of any theory except a machine for explaining the phenomena we see? But the wave function appears to be something real. Okay, so uh, particle in the box. I mean, like I said, it's the it's the block on the inclined plane of quantum mechanics. But now you know how to solve it. But why did I waste your time? So there is a, a, a phenomenon that I think you'll care about that's related to the particle being stuck inside a box. Uh, uh, story, and that is the um, the atom. So, if you were a classical physicist, again going back to Newton, Galileo, or Maxwell, and these things, and you had the idea, if you understood that the atom consisted of a dense, char positively charged nucleus surrounded by negatively charged electrons, you might do as Niels Bohr did and come up with what's called the planetary model of the atom. Okay, and this is a is a pretty good model of the atom. It's not perfect, but it's a pretty good model. And, and it has, um, as I said, a positively charged core and then atoms, uh, electrons going on, on orbits, circular orbits around this positively charged thing. And you can describe this fairly well with the laws of classical mechanics, electrodynamics and things like that, electrostatics, you know, positive and negative charges attract one another, circular motion and all that good stuff. However, if you dug a little bit deeper, you'd realize that the electron, when it goes on a circular orbit, right, at a fixed speed, what, the, what is one of the features of circular motion is that you're constantly accelerating, right? Because you, you're going at a fixed speed, but your direction is always changing. You're going around in a circle, and acceleration means you have, is a change of velocity, and a velocity has a direction associated with it. So the fact that you're constantly accelerating has repercussions if you're a charged particle. Because if you're a charged particle and you accelerate, the laws of electrodynamics, classical physics, say that you must radiate some light. So this means that in this Niels Bohr model of the atom, all these electrons are going around in their orbit, right? And they're constantly emitting energy. And so they're losing energy, they're emitting light, they're losing energy. And so over some period of time, these electrons will, their radius of their orbit will shrink until eventually the innermost electrons will hit the nucleus and the atom will no longer be the size it used to be. Uh, and you can do the calculation in classical mechanics and you find that the lifetime of an atom is less than nanoseconds. So no atom should exist, right? You set up this system under classical uh, mechanics, it's unstable, the electron spirals into the nucleus, no more atom, no more chemistry, no more biology, no more us, okay? Um, so that's bad, uh, but, Quantum mechanics comes to the rescue. And quantum mechanics comes to the rescue for multiple reasons. But one way of understanding it is that this, um, the, the equations that describe the electron going around the orbit are very, very similar to the electron trapped in a box with the one um, modification that instead of the string being held down at the two ends, I take those two ends and I loop them back around and I join them up. Right, so I have to be able to now do excitations on the of the string in such a way that I can join those two ends together, right? And so that just as for the box, when I held it down, there were only certain modes that were allowed inside the box. When you try to wrap the wave function around the orbit of the electron, only certain um, wave functions in certain orbits are allowed because, as you see, the one on the left, right, it doesn't join the wave function doesn't join back up with itself smoothly and the one on the right i get the two ends to join back up so they're wiggling in just the right way 
And what this means is that there is a lowest mode, just like the particle in the box, there was no mode for the wave function below this one called E1, right? There was nothing I could do. There's no way I could pluck the string in any way that would allow the two ends to remain fixed. So there was no, no mode below that. So the same is true in the atom. There's a, like a lowest mode the electron can be in. You can make it excited and eventually it will de-excite and will come down to that mode. But once it hits that arrangement, once it has that wave function, it can't go to anything else. And so that's different from the Bohr atom, right? Because in the Bohr atom with the classical description, it could keep losing energy and slowly spiral into the middle. But once it hits that last stable orbit, it can't go anywhere because of quantum mechanics. It's and the fact that the orbits are essentially quantized in the same way that the energy was quantized earlier. So that means that the lowest stable orbit has nowhere to go to, and so it really is stable. And quantum mechanics stabilizes the atom, and thanks to quantum mechanics, you're all here. Isn't that wonderful? Okay. Questions? Yes. Uh, yeah, so flat would mean nothing anywhere. So you need uh, you need some amount of slope for it to, to mean that there, because I can just, nothing is, there's no feature anywhere, right? So there's no concept of a particle anymore. It's, uh, you, I, yeah, there, there's nothing there. There's, uh, um, you, in order for, how do I say this? It's one of the rules of quantum mechanics. I can say it that way, and we can dig into it offline uh, a little bit more. Um, okay, let me see. Where was I? Okay, good. So, um, so one of the byproducts, if you like, of stabilizing the atom uh, that's again connected to quantum mechanics. And so, somebody was asking me uh, in the break, why is it that all of your stories about how we discover quantum mechanics are related to light? And one of my answers was that. It didn't need to be that way. There were clues all over the place that we only understand in retrospect. And uh, uh, these are one of the clues. So in chemistry, way before 1900, it was noticed that every material, every material has a unique fingerprint, right? If you um, take magnesium or something and vaporize it, it emits light in a very particular way. Or if you take a gas, a test tube full of a gas and shine light through it, it absorbs light in a very particular way. There are absorption lines and emission lines. So that's denoted here. So the, the light that comes out of the sun is some continuous spectrum. If you let that sunlight pass through a test tube of gas, you get the bottom thing. You get the continuous spectrum with a few bits missing. You have these few absorption lines, very narrow places where there's no light, these black lines, right? And these occur at very regular intervals. So in a particular material, they occur at, at um, the, the frequency is, has this, there's this, was this weird formula that people wrote down just because it fit the data, but they had no idea where it came from, right? The, the, the positions of these frequencies looked like the difference of one over two integers squared, right? So you take N1 and N2 to be four and three or seven and nine and things like that. Then that would determine for you the position of these lines in these different materials. And nobody could quite figure out why they just used it to their advantage. And it comes out because of the atom and because of quantum mechanics and because of these shells that are only stable orbits in certain places because angular momentum is quantized, like we talked about with the guitar string and wrapping it around. So because of it, that, quantum mechanics explains why they saw what they saw. And just on pass on, I'll mention that, that these absorption lines uh, led to the discovery of helium. And I love this story because helium is the only element ever discovered, uh, ex it's an extraterrestrial element. It's the only element that was discovered somewhere other than Earth. So helium was discovered on the sun before we knew of its existence on Earth. And it was discovered precisely for this reason. It was discovered because of quantum mechanics, but we didn't know it was because of quantum mechanics. You see, it was discovered in 1868. But the reason we were able to discover it was because quantum mechanics was behind the scenes. And the way we did it is we looked at sunlight and we looked at, compared sunlight to uh, very, very carefully. We looked at different regions and we could see lines if we look very carefully inside that continuous spectrum are occasionally brighter lines. And you, you compare all those brighter lines to your textbook of, a, of emission spectra. 
And you can go through and you can say, oh, that line comes from this element, this line comes from carbon, this one comes from oxygen, this one comes from hydrogen. You knock them all off the thing you see from the sun and you're left with one set of lines and they don't correspond to any element you have on earth. And they said, well, this must be a new element because it's a series of lines. We know all elements have lines and we discovered it in the sun and the Greek word for sun is helios. So let's call it helium. And then we discovered it years later on the earth. And that's all because of quantum mechanics. Yes. Yes. No, no two elements share the same pattern of lines. It's, they're just like fingerprints. And this, for, for your question earlier, this is, if you like, uh, so this is what I, I've been using to describe it, the so-called Bohr atom. But in reality, the atom is more like this, where, and this is the electron cloud you're talking about. This is the probability distribution of where you find electrons in one particular energy level of the hydrogen atom. And you see there are places where you're more likely to find it, which are the bright spots, and places where you're less likely to find the electron, the dimmer spots, right? Yes. One question from the chat. Um, so what exactly do physicists mean when they say the wave function collapses upon observation? Very good question. Can you hold that question for two minutes? Thank you. OK, uh, I'll get to it. Um, so the last uh, major player in the story of quantum mechanics is uh, Werner Heisenberg. And he invented something called the Heisenberg uncertainty principle. Um, and that's stated here both in words and in formula. So uh, in words, it's that you can't precisely determine simultaneously the position and momentum of a particle. There's some limit to how, if you know one really well, you'll know the other less well. And that's encoded in the formula again. Anytime you see a formula with an H in it, you know it has to be quantum mechanical in nature. So this is saying the uncertainty in position times the uncertainty in momentum has to be bigger than H divided by two. And, and it comes about, the Heisenberg uncertainty principle basically comes about because of the wave function and because uh, even particles have associated with them wave-like properties associated to the, the Broglie wavelength. Okay, so somebody asked me this at the break, um, uh, that uh, they'd heard that if you try to measure the double slit experiment, you break it, and that's indeed true. Uh, and that, by break, I mean, you don't actually break the equipment, but you don't see the, um, the interference pattern. And that comes about because of the Heisenberg uncertainty principle. So the act of measurement disturbs the system you're observing. So how do we observe anything as, crazy small as electrons going through uh, a, a biprism through this double slit. So we have to use a microscope, right? We have to look at the two slits through a microscope that is capable of resolving very, very small distances and wait to see the electron go through one slit or the other. Because we know it's an electron, it can't be split up. It has to go through one or the other. Surely there's something going on like that. So let's look at the two slits and see one by one where the electron goes. Now, to see something very, very small like an electron, you need to have very, very precise determination. You need to be able to see which slit it goes through, and those slits are very close together. So you need to use a very short wavelength of light. In particular, the wavelength of light you need to use should be comparable to the resolution you want to get, to the separation and distances you want to be able to resolve. OK, so we need to use a short wavelength of light of order the separation between the slits. But we also know that we should think about electrons as particles, right? And we know from de Broglie that if you have a short wavelength uh, object, it corresponds to a high momentum object. And we know that from billiard balls, if you throw a billiard ball really fast at another one, the one you hit goes whizzing off at a high speed. So what we want to do is want to shine light onto one of these gaps, wait for an electron to go through, the electron hits the light and the light comes back to our eye and we see which uh, gap, the elect which slit the electron went through. Uh, but in the process of doing that, in the process of the light hitting the electron, it's going to disturb the path of the electron. And the amount by which it disturbs it will be comparable to the amount of momentum the light had coming in. And there you see the momentum determined by de Broglie is one over the wavelength of the light. One, second, one over the wavelength of the light you shone on it. So you disturb the electron by an amount uh, inversely proportional to the wavelength of the light. Yeah, good question. If you have something that detects it on either on the heat, it's not being slow, that detects it with just the electron passing it, can you observe that that also messes? Uh, 
I think that's what I'm trying to that's what I'm trying to describe doing. So you you can instead of observing both slits, you could just look at one of the gaps and see if an electron goes through. And if you don't see it go through, it must have gone through the other one. And so what you'd want to do is you want to, but you want to be able to be sure the electron you're seeing is is in that gap and not in the other ones. You need the resolving power to be comparable to the gap separation. Does that does that help? Okay. Yes. That's correct. Yeah. So the question was, what what happens to the electron after the light hits it, and and its path is different from it would have been had the light not hit it. So in other words, we know without observing that we get the interference pattern shown here on the screen, right? Because uh, we've done the experiment. I showed you the movie, um, and that was where we didn't try to work out where the electron went. We just fired them at the double slit, and we observed what happened. We got the interference pattern. Now I'm gonna sit there with a microscope and monitor the, 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 the slits at the beginning, the thing with A separation, right? And I'm gonna shine my light with the right frequency, the right wavelength to be able to resolve which gap it goes through. And as a result, if I see an electron, I disturb the electron. The active measurement disturbs the system. And you can see there that the amount of momentum I give to the electron turns out to be just right to move it the distance between two fringes. In the interference pattern. So essentially, thanks to the Heisenberg uncertainty principle. So the Heisenberg uncertainty principle put numbers into this statement. It told me how small I could never make this product of unknown position and unknown momentum smaller than h over two. And when I follow all the way through, making it as small as I can, right, it's still too big and it messes up the interference pattern. So the quantum mechanics basically uh um protects itself right so if i can work out which uh gap the electron goes through then that means it only went through one gap it shouldn't interfere and sure enough i don't get an interference pattern but if i don't know which gap it goes through if there's some unknown and it can act it can it could have gone through either and then it can interfere and i can get the interference pattern um, okay now, uh, uh, I just quickly added this slide because Brian mentioned it uh, um, uh, when he was talking about the history of, of U Chicago and Fermilab and the connections between Argon and Oppenheimer and Fermi and people. Um, and he was talking about radioactive decay and putting it to good use. Uh, and uh, um, radioactive decay is another place where quantum mechanics shows up. So you can think of radioactive decay as uh, for very heavy elements like uranium. One of the ways they decay is through alpha emission. So that's the emission of a helium nucleus from inside this way bigger nucleus. And if you um, look at the, the nucleus and you look at what that helium, what the alpha particle experiences inside the nucleus, it's trapped inside the nucleus. And what it, so there, there is a, an alpha particle in there. And what I'm drawn here is the force it experiences pulling it back in, into the nucleus. So in other words, while it's inside the nucleus, it doesn't really feel much, but if it tries to get out, it's presented with a massive barrier, of what they call a potential barrier to its motion. And the energy of the particle is very low. So it doesn't have enough energy to climb up over that potential barrier. So from a classical perspective, alpha particles should never come out of uh, nuclei because they don't have enough energy to get over the barrier. It's kind of like, just think of it as a mountain range and you're living in a valley, and you want to go to the other side of the mountain range, but you're tired, so you don't have enough energy in your legs to climb up the mountain and come down the other side. Okay, there's a potential barrier to you getting out of the valley. And there's a potential barrier to the alpha particle getting out of the nucleus. But we see, um, uh, we see alpha decay of heavy nuclei. Right? We see this type of radioactivity. And the reason we see it is because of quantum mechanics, because quantum mechanics has this uncertainty associated with it that there's a little bit of uncertainty in exactly what energy this alpha particle has. And so, and it, uncertainty in its position, and it can essentially tunnel through that barrier to thanks to the power of quantum mechanics. It can briefly 
get through that barrier without having extra energy and appear on the other side of the barrier. And once it's on the other side of the barrier, it's free to keep going because it just rolls downhill and disappears. So the alpha decay of uranium-238 happens because of quantum mechanics. So this uh, story that Brian was telling us is at its core, again, because of the quantum mechanical um, uh, nature of nature. Okay, here's a cartoon. All right, so somebody already asked this question, superpositions. So um, uh, one way to think of the wave function, because it's probabilistic in nature, is that it encodes all the possibilities. Okay, so the wave function is a machine for like keeping track of all the different answers you could get for a particular question. And the wave function itself is, because it has to know all the answers at once, it's in what we call a superposition. So the wave function is a superposition of all possibilities. And um, what the laws of quantum mechanics tell you is the chance of any one of those possibilities happening on average, right? So it doesn't tell you uh, on any particular go around what's going to happen, but it does tell you if I do the same experiment a thousand times, I'll get this answer 400 times and this answer 500 times and this other answer 100 times, right? So um, that's the way the wave function works in quantum mechanics. And the words that go along with that, uh, somebody I think already mentioned, is that when you take a measurement, you collapse the wave function. So the wave function before a measurement is taken is in a superposition of all possibilities. Then you take a measurement and you know which possibility you've got for that wave function and you've collapsed it into that one possibility of where the particle in the box is or where the uranium atom is or uh, whatever it happens to be. And that story that I just described of wave function collapse is what goes by the name of the Copenhagen interpretation of quantum mechanics because it came out of the Copenhagen school of Niels Bohr and company who were some of the founding uh, fathers of quantum mechanics. They wrote down a lot of the rules and they got very confused as to how to interpret them. And they came up with a story called the Copenhagen interpretation. And it leads to this rather bizarre and rather cruel experiment that you all probably heard about in the popular press, right? But uh, um, you can do what's called a Schrodinger cat experiment. Okay, and we don't actually do this experiment, um, but they wanted to, if, if this is a real Gedanken experiment, uh, and they wanted to, to use this to illustrate some of the weirdness of quantum mechanics and how you can get yourself um, uh, tied up in knots trying to think about what's going on because your intuition is classical and the equations are quantum mechanical. So here's the story. They put in a box, which is sealed, they, they put inside the box two, two things, or maybe it's three things, a cat, and then a uranium atom, like the one I've just described, that has a 50-50 chance of emitting an alpha particle in the next hour. And connected to that, uh, next to that uranium particle is a, as a uh, Geiger counter that will, deter, it will detect that emission of an alpha particle. If it detects it, it drops a hammer on a vial of cyanide and kills this poor cat. Okay, so it's a terrible idea. Uh, and now the question is, to back in the days of the beginning of quantum mechanics, is how do you describe the wave function of the cat? Okay, because as I said, the wave function is supposed to be a superposition of all possible outcomes of an experiment, and then uh, it's supposed to encode all possibilities until you do a measurement. So there are two possibilities, each, each of them equally likely, right? Because there's a 50-50 chance this radiation, as radioactive decay happens. So if the radioactive decay happens, this poor cat is poisoned by the cyanide. If it doesn't happen, this poor cat's pissed off, but it's, it's alive and well. It's kind of angry, but that's about it. Um, so you have a grumpy cat and a dead cat in your wave function, and that's it. Uh, and the, the laws of quantum mechanics say that because they, I can't look inside the box until I open the lid, that the wave function of the cat is a 50-50 superposition of grumpy and dead. Okay, um, and and that feels weird because it is weird. There's no two ways about it. Um, but that is the the sort of um, the world you get into when you try to just think of quantum mechanical systems in classical ways. Yes. Yeah, that's right. It was it's 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 never been done this experiment, <laughs> and it's just proposed to to illustrate 
how complicated quantum mechanics can be to think about. I don't, I'm not, a, I'm not a great expert on the history of all of these characters. Uh, my understanding is, is Bohr was quite uh, headstrong. So uh, I don't think he conceded much about the Copenhagen interpretation. The Copenhagen interpretation is, has some strange baggage associated with it that you have to describe the people doing the experiment as classical systems, the thing being experimented on as a quantum mechanical system. And those two fall into separate buckets, as it were, right? They're described in different ways. Um, and, uh, and, and that that probably isn't right. We think everything is quantum mechanical. You can't suddenly say just because they're doing an experiment, they don't follow the laws of quantum mechanics. However, uh, I mean, so there, there are alternative interpretations, right? There's a whole list of possible ways of trying to um, understand how the wave function collapses, what exactly is going on at the microscopic level. Um, so as I said, you know, in the Copenhagen interpretation, you have to partition observers from objects being experimented on, and they have to treat them as two separate systems, two separate classes. Um, and there are a whole lot of alternatives. There's the many worlds interpretation, which is also scary. That says every time the wave function collapses, it actually doesn't; it just bifurcates. Uh, then there are things which slightly modify the laws of quantum mechanics to have spontaneous collapse. There are Bohmian hidden variable theories. Um, the thing is that even though all of these have their own little uh, idiosyncrasies, they all essentially predict the same outcomes for experiments. So there's a famous quote by David Merman that uh, sort of sums up the, the working physicist philosophy to these different philosophies, which is uh, just shut up and calculate. So uh, um, we now have these laws of quantum mechanics and they work incredibly well. And we know they work incredibly well because we've done countless experiments on quantum mechanical systems and they've always confirmed our uh, predictions. So we think we understand uh, how quantum mechanics works, at least at the level of being able to make predictions and comparing those predictions to, uh, um, to nature. And in fact, it works, quantum mechanics works so well that we've now entered this regime where we can use quantum mechanics as a tool to do other things. So it's not just that we uh, are trying to understand how nature works. We now understand this part of nature so well, we can put it to good use. And you probably heard, uh, 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 Leah mentioned it in the opening remarks, that we're now doing, um, uh, we're now manipulating quantum systems at the quantum level to do interesting quantum things for us. And one of those things, for instance, is we can take computers like you have in your cell phone, your laptop, all that stuff, they work in a very, literally a very binary way, right? In computers, there are two numbers, zero and one. And all the stuff that computers do for us, whether it's download YouTube videos or do complicated calculations or whatever it is, uh, they're doing that all in using just zeros and ones behind the scenes. Um, but quantum mechanics has this promise to allow us to do lots of things at once because wave functions can be in more than one state. They can be in a superposition of many states as we talked about. And in particular, you could imagine taking a bit, right, the, the zero one object in a computer and making the quantum mechanical version for it, a version of it, which is called a qubit. And that thing, because it's quantum mechanical, can be manipulated in a quantum mechanical way. And it can be put into not just zero or one, but some combination of zero and one. So it can be in a, in a superposition um, of states. And this allows us to do many things to that qubit at once that would require us to use many q uh, many bits in a classical computer. So we can take um, uh, there are various algorithms that can be run on a quantum computer that can run a lot faster than they can on a classical computer, exponentially faster. And this allows us to do once we get all of the qubits under control and get quantum computers to be uh, large enough scale, it promises to allow us to do some calculations that we cannot do in a finite reasonable time on a classical computer. Um, and uh, uh, not only that, it, it'll, it'll, it provides us a tool, as we'll see in a couple of transparencies, provides us a tool to do even more precise measurements of nature than we have before, because we can manipulate things at the quantum level. Um, 
So, so this is, I think we're now entered sort of a new realm of quantum mechanics, if you like. We've understood it, we've got it under control. We know how to do all the calculations. We know how the systems work quantum mechanically. Now we can use it as a tool to, uh, to probe other things. Yes. So we have a way to quantify super frequency. Do we have a way to quantify entanglement in the super frequency? You know, we can quantify entanglement and how much things are entangled, yeah. Um, so I'm running out of time. So let me let me finish up as quickly as I can. So here is a couple of examples. So as I mentioned at the end, not only can we build uh, quantum computers to do calculations, we can build exquisite quantum systems that we can all, uh, that we can measure very very precisely. And I'm particularly interested in the sort of quantum devices we can build that are very very sensitive to external uh, perturbations of a particular type that allow us to go after some of the mysteries in nature. So I'm very interested in, in dark matter and what dark matter is. Uh, we know it's out there, but we haven't been able to get our hands on the stuff in the lab yet. Um, but it's possible that we could build, um, we're doing this at Fermilab, to build uh, uh, quantum devices who, because of their quantum mechanics, quantum mechanical nature, allow us to probe to uh, even weaker and weaker interactions than we have before. It may allow us to uncover various dark matter candidates could be out there. Um, here's a picture on the bottom right uh, of some stuff that we're uh, uh, developing at Fermilab that allows us to manipulate these qubits in very precise ways that eventually will be maybe one of the pieces that goes into building one of these large scale quantum computers so that we can do um, very big calculations. So, um, so we're using quantum mechanics as a tool uh, and to probe nature, but quantum mechanics has had payoff in the past as well, right? So those computers that were using classical bits, zeros and ones, those are all built around transistor technology and to understand how transistors and semiconductors work requires us to understand quantum mechanics. Lasers, MRI machines, all these things that are sort of the high tech part of our everyday life uh, couldn't have come into existence, superconductors, all these types of things. Without, uh, um, without our understanding of quantum mechanics. I would claim that Fermilab probably wouldn't have come into existence without our understanding of quantum mechanics. So I'm very glad for us, first of all, understanding quantum mechanics and then building a place that can work. So, um, but as crazy as it may seem, quantum mechanics is not the final story. I think in the next week or two, you're going to hear about special relativity, which is one of Einstein's great achievements. You take the idea of special relativity from that lecture, you take the idea of quantum mechanics from this lecture, you smush them together and you get something even crazier than quantum mechanics called quantum field theory. And uh, you lose the concept of empty space now. You have particles popping in and out of existence everywhere. You have particles and antiparticles, virtual particles, all sorts of really cool stuff uh, as a result of taking quantum mechanics and making that one step forward. If you walk into any uh, office on my floor of Wilson Hall at Fermilab and look at any blackboard, you'll see diagrams like this on the left, Feynman diagrams. This is how we as theorists communicate to each other about how quantum mechanics is behaving inside colliders and things like this. Um, quantum field theory describes nature at even shorter distances in quantum mechanics. It's key for uh, uh, experiments like the Tevatron, the LHC and, and other uh, colliders. So, um, but despite all that awesomeness, quantum mechanics, special relativity, quantum field theory, we don't think that uh, these things are the uh, final story. We think there's something going on at an even shorter distance scale in nature. Uh, we don't yet know what it is. Uh, and uh, I will be very excited to find out. I don't know if I will, but I hope somebody in this room will figure it out for me and let me know. Um, and so with that, I will stop. Thanks. <laughs>